thanks for coming, everybody. Welcome to Behind the Book with Larry Thacker. We're here to discuss his book, uh, Working It Off in Labor County. It's a book of short stories, and I found it highly amusing. So, um, so Larry, what, what got you interested in writing? <sighs> Wanting to stay alive. <laughs> Other writers will understand that, right? You, you uh, I don't know the, the, the things that started me writing way back when I was in my early, early twenties, that's just not the same animal that I am now. Right. It's, it's totally different interests, totally different motivations for writing. But back then it was, it was uh, family stories and more along the lines of uh, sort of nonfiction stories and, and uh, themed on my interest in how how varied stories were between tellings and the, the one story that everyone loved to tell was a murder, a murder story that was in the family. See both my, both my grandfathers, my mother's mother's father, my father's father knew each other as early teenagers in Middlesbrough, Kentucky, back when Middlesbrough was like a wide open town and there were killings in the street every weekend and there was gambling and prostitution and, and, and it was just Middlesbrough was a crazy boom town and they were um, they they'd run around a lot and um, they witnessed a double murder one night uh, when they were they were running down the railroad tracks and they heard a commotion and there was a card argument in a tenant house down from where both of them lived and they were hiding on the far side of the berm and they watched two men shoot and kill each other right on the spot. And the house still stands, you know, after all these years. And one, one of the men fell back into the house dead. The other man fell over the front gate of the, of the front yard dead and the gate went, with them, you know, it's very dramatic. And immediately, of course, the lady that ran the boarding house, she started having ghost story, ghost issues in the house. And of course, the boys swore to each other, oh, we can't talk about what we've seen. We just saw a murder, murders. And about, <laughs> you know, the, the whole neighborhood down, you know, Mud Lake, where one of them lived and, and Fern Lake, Fern Lake Hill, uh, where uh, the other one lived. Everyone heard about it, of course. And then about a month later, when this lady couldn't take it anymore, she just needed some help. My my father's father's father came to my grandfather saying, you know, that lady, uh, Miss Johnson, down the road here where that awful murder took place. Remember, you, did you hear about that? He said, well, I volunteered you to go down and stay with her a couple of nights a week uh, just to, to help her feel better. And of course, he couldn't say anything. All, it's all a true story and he didn't he didn't last one night he he hopped you know he he couldn't make it and he ran from the house he, he's heard things in the attic he heard things in the room and so i'll tell you that story to tell you that uh every time i heard the story i heard it a little differently and to uh um to a teenager like i was that fascinated me and that led eventually to me starting a column in the in the Cumberland Gap in the Cumberland what was it called the Cumberland Trading Post which was the you know the you know the the, the trading post back home in Middlesbrough and in the surrounding county where you sold your your cars and your lawn mowers and your pit bulls or whatever um, and so I, I went to them and said I've got an idea for um, a column and it was called Mountain Mysteries and so I started Gather, and that was the first story I told was the swinging gate of Fern Lake Hollow uh, because people told the ghost story of that gate swinging open by itself and never being able to stay closed and the hauntings that took place. And then that led to other family stories. So I started as a sort of a nonfiction, sort of a, trying to put stories to nonfiction stories or historical fiction. And that years later, some years later, 
eventualized into my first book, which came out in, in 07 with Overmount Press called Mountain Mysteries, the Mystic Traditions of Appalachia. And that was after I had left the area, gone into army for five years, come back, went to work at Lincoln Memorial, spent a couple of years gathering more stories and going all over the countryside. And this is before the X-Files came out as a, as, a, as a show, but I was out doing X-Files work, chasing ghost stories, Bigfoot stories, lights in the sky, uh, interviewing witches, uh, inter interviewing uh, uh, alien abductees, you name it. And that's, you know, what filled up the Mountain Mysteries book was, and, and also death and dying lore and things that stayed with me as, as, as obsessions going into writing fiction as well. So those, that informed all of my writing up to now. And then eventually I fell in love with, with my true love, which was poetry, which I wrote for several years. And then when I went back to school and got my, my MFA not too long ago, I studied both fiction and well, poetry and fiction. And that's when I started trying fiction out and, and said, wow, I, you know, I've, I'm really enjoying this. And that's, that's when stories started coming about that ended up being the uh, working off in Labor County. Yeah. And so sometimes that grain of truth makes for the best fiction. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That might've been a long, a long answer to what you're asking. Oh, that's about. great. We, we, we that's, like long answers. We like talking. That's the, the, that's the meandering <laughs> answer to your question. We, we got a bonus story in there. That's always well yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, what does your writing process look like when you're putting these stories together? Well, I think that like, I think most writers will tell you that you're, you're constantly listening and watching. And that if you watch and listen enough, that everyday life gives you all the storytelling you need. Standing in line, you know, at the grocery store, standing in line at a restaurant, <clears throat> listening. You know, I work at an antique store during the day, you know, four or five days a week. And, you know, people, <laughs> stories are walking in the front door you know, all day long. And, and those and it's those don't come in as complete stories. They're just little kernels of ideas. It's, it's what this particular man looks like. It's what this particular woman says. It's what this particular person is wearing. Um, it's all of those things combined. And as you're taking mental and physically taking notes constantly, so that eventually um, you'll say, oh, OK, now I know what that particular kernel is, is sort of blooming into. And uh, some ideas never come to nothing. You know, I've got, promise you, 50 story starts that I know are going to be great stories. But they're right now they're only at the first paragraph or, you know, just a little quick little outline of the idea, because I I can walk from here to the other side of the house and forget a great idea. It, it happens that fast. And I've I have forgotten so many great stories already, you know, that'll just never, never come back to me. You know, I'll, I'll tell my wife, please remind me before we get home. When we get home, please remind me of this one line that I thought of but I'm driving and I can't <laughs> send yeah. myself an email. I send myself emails all the time. So as far as process goes, that's, that's, that's the, the beginning of, of all stories is that process of, of layering on lots of things from lots of different directions. It's never just one thing. And then as far as like when, I'm an early morning person. I write almost every morning because I, I get up early. But because I'm, for lack of a better word, blessed to work in an environment where I have some time, I, I can work and do a lot of revision and when I'm at work. So I'm, I can do, do some writing when I'm in my work environment. And because I... <clears throat> decided to do that as a way of paying the bills because I wanted to write full time. You know, I, I, I teach adjunct because I, I 
don't want to, I don't want a full-time teaching job right now. And I sling vintage stuff part-time because I know if I had a, if I had a full-time gig of anything, I know, you know, that getting in four or five hours of writing a day would suffer. Oh, sure. And that's, that's, at this point in my life, that's what I wanted to, to be able to eventually do. And that's what I'm managing to do now. And that's why I went back to school to get that MFA. So I could say, i am got to make this worth doing mm -hmm. to me. And, uh, so what inspired you to write this specific book? That I didn't start out to write this, this specific okay. book at all. This, this uh, two or three of these stories came about, directly from the MFA program. Um, uh, at least two of them were written under the mentorship of Marie Manila, uh, a West Virginia writer, fantastic West Virginia writer. Uh, a couple of them were written before the program. And, and then like then the, another half of the book was, was written when I realized that I had a theme going and I was like, Oh, this might, this might be a book. And then you get the challenge. Same thing with the poetry book. It's like, well, Oh my, okay. What, you know, do I, I, somewhere along the process of putting together a book of poetry, you go, Oh, here's a theme or here's Michael. How, how do you, how do you title a, a, a collection of songs, you know, an album, you know, it's like, do you start out and go, I'm going to start an album and it's going to be called blank. You, you never do that. Right. You know, it's hard, you hardly ever do it. And just like this, it's, it's, um, I didn't know what the fictional place was going to be called right off. In fact, they weren't uh, all going to be from a fictional place called labor, labor County and labor town until we were in the, um, uh, until we'd con contracted with West Virginia University Press and we were getting into that revision process. There were some of, some of them that weren't there. Um, but they, they've grown. Um, Bottom Dog Press is putting out the second volume of these stories by the fall. So there are even more of these stories from, from Labor County coming out, you know, this year. So... <clears throat> It's like you're, you know, you know to, to use an analogy, I guess, you, you, you're stirring, you know, what you've got and things start to pool eventually. Yeah. And that's what you're doing. And some of the stories are the, some of the junk stories sort of slide to the to the outside of the pot and some of the good stuff whirlpools to the middle. And eventually you, you, you let go and you go, OK, well, what's happening? And then eventually you get this conglomeration like out in the Pacific ocean, the big, all oh, the big, the big plastic Island that's, that, <laughs> yeah. that's, 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 that's coming together. That's what writing's like, you know, it all just, all the plastic finds each other <laughs> for what it's worth. And then you go, Oh, you know, it's a book. That's how, that's how, that's how it happens. <laughs> It's it's a it's a little more entertaining than than plastic in the ocean. I'll I'll say. <laughs> so there's a lot of interesting stuff happening out there on Plastic <laughs> Island, though. Uh, so, um, how do you do, do? Do you have like an editor put the stories in a particular order, or do you kind of decide the order there? Or? It's about eighty percent me, ten twenty percent them. Mm -hmm. You know, and and you know each book is different. Uh, in November, uh, C.M. Chapman and myself, we wrote a book of, of short stories called Everyday Monsters. And there's a comma there, you know, we, we it's a book, of, it's a monster, it's a monster collection, plus lots of stories about people who are monstrous. Mm -hmm. uh, that's out from Unsolicited Press in November. So every every publishing house is different. Um, they'll suggest a, uh, order, but for the most part, uh, I think it's for the most part, it's in the author's hands as to, 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 
how things are laid out. There should be, you know, it should be a fairly obvious way that things proceed in your storytelling. Well, and I, and I feel like, you know, definitely in this book, you know, some of them kind of, you know, go refer back to other ones in a way or characters from previous yeah, ones. Yeah. Like the first first story uh, sort of sets up the whole book because I ref in the first story, the the guy who's speaking, he actually refers in brief to at least half a dozen stories. It's yeah. very subtle, uh, but he he's sort of talking about the area. So that's important. It, it, it needed to be the first story. Uh, the Uncle Archie stories, I think. Um, I'll tell you the very first Uncle Archie story, the one where he acquires a cryo tube um, <laughs> for the, the oddity store. I wrote that one at a George Singleton workshop at the Mountain Heritage Literary Festival about five years ago. Alan, was that when George was there? Um, George, George is, is one of my one of my idols. I just um, and, and and for them to 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 uh, and for George to blurb it and for it to it, for them to say in, in some reviews, if you like George Singleton, you'll love this book. I I about peed myself over that. That was pretty, that was pretty cool. Um, because I've been reading George for for years and and. Uh, and he's he's had a, a big influence on a lot of my writing. I, I you know I love gritty writing about misfit, you know, mountain types. I love Harry Cruz. I love Ron Rash. I love George Singleton, um, Larry Brown. You know all the usuals. Chris Offit. You know these are all the usual suspects when it comes to to gritty writing. Um, Charles Dodd White. Yes. Uh, you know, just, you know, the, the folks that you would expect to to hear in that conversation. Yeah, we, we had him earlier this year, Charles. Yeah. No, he's he he's a real poetic writer of fiction. He, there's a poem in every paragraph of his writing. It, it's very different. Mine, mine's pretty to the point. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm a very different type of writer. Um, even my poetry is not that descriptive you know but he's yeah he's 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 quite the uh and i would say that uh, michael your writing is is like that as well it's very descriptive and beautiful writing so uh do you have a favorite story in this book <laughs> <laughs> I, it, I, you know there there's a whole range of of em emotional um places with these you know I, I, I have a favorite funny story and I have a favorite tragic story. There's a whole lot of pain and suffering in some of these. And there's a whole lot of humor in some of these too. I think my favorite humorous straight up humor story is probably riding shotgun with Dory, the squirrel on the turkey yes. story. That's just, I don't know where that came from. That was, I wrote that one under the tutelage of Marie Manila. That one came out of nowhere. I have no idea. I have very little, inspiration for where they came from. I don't, I didn't have anybody that was a leather worker in my family. Nobody who ever like crossbred wild turkeys. No one ever tried to train, you know, train squirrels. It was straight out of the, wherever that stuff comes in the, in the, in the, from the, in the head. So that's probably the, just the wildest one. Um, everyone's got an uncle Archie in their family. Who's just, who's just weird. Um, but I think there's a lot of me and Uncle Archie because I collect <laughs> oddities because I have the largest clown collection that I sell I, that you'll ever you'll ever see. Mm -hmm. So I think there's there's a, probably a lot of some of my family in the Uncle Archie stories and my and myself. Um, as far as like the biggest, my favorite tearjerker story probably the art of grief about the um the uh the artist working on the crucifix that's on the the stone wall where his daughter passed away in the, in the car wreck and again I, I, I the opposite end of things 
um, there are places where I have these Genesis ideas. I know where that that rock formation is at in my head, mm -hmm. and I know where it's at physically too. There's a, a turn headed toward Tazewell, Tennessee, that is probably the the candidate rock wall where that probably would have happened. You know, if it happened, you know. Um, Hope that answers your question. No, uh, these, are, these are good yeah. questions. Yeah, yeah some of these definitely, are, definitely yeah. notice the you know big range of emotions. I was really struck by the one about the the boy with the that would speak in tongues. You know that yeah, was yeah. that was ooh, you yeah, know yeah, he, got me. yeah yeah and uh, yeah yeah. I, uh, my grandfather would drag me to, and I would go happily, but I hung up with my papa at a young age, and we were inseparable. Um, and he would go to funerals as a social event ah. and, uh, whether he knew who died or not, right. seriously. And, <laughs> and, uh, so I, I just imagined this, this poor young man who had these natural, this gift of healing, but didn't know what to do with it who had a mother, a just frustrated mother who was at her wits end and who wits end who, and who didn't know what to do next and who had to like pick him up and move somewhere else every time that, that he wore out their welcome. Yeah. You know, because he was healing too many people <laughs> or he was reading minds too much or speaking in, tongues or channeling these ancient languages you know mm -hmm. and in the end it just it was too much for both of them to stay together mm -hmm. and these while well, these these characters pick up in the second volume as well oh great aunt, aunt betty who he goes to live with basically um aunt betty is a character in the second volume because what happens i'll tell you this a little okay. spoiler spoiler alert Ooh. uncle archie um, <laughs> Uncle Archie, it starts out, go for all the, the international travel that Uncle Archie had done, you would have thought he'd had, he'd had um, an ice cream headache at least once in his life, <laughs> but he hadn't. And he took everybody out to eat at uh, this big buffet. And uh, he challenged everyone to a soft serve eating contest. And he, uh, of course, he didn't know what he'd gotten himself into. And the narrator, of course, is is, is uh, the Uncle Archie's nephew, the speaker, always. And he dismissed himself to the bathroom. He said, I, I'm full. I don't need any soft serve ice cream. And so when he comes back from the bathroom, he finds Uncle Archie just, he's <laughs> laying on the, on, the, on the floor of the restaurant. <laughs> holding his head, screaming, and people all around him, one guy going, he's having a heart attack. Another guy going, he's got the diabetes. And the other guy is saying, no, it's a stroke. And, and, and the people are dialing 911, and he's he's having his first ice cream headache in his life. And he's, because he, 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 he won the contest. You know? <laughs> and he put down like two bowls of soft serve, and he he's dying from this headache. But he's, he's hurting so bad he can't speak. <laughs> he's just he doesn't know what to say he's rolling on the floor in pain but when he's when he, in the middle of this attack he he's blacking out and he sees the light and he has a near a, a near-death experience like an out-of-body experience during his ice cream headache well he tries to explain this to the family after he recovers he said what, what were all the lights He's like, well, I mean, the, the, EMT, the ENTs were flashing the lights in your eyes, you know, the, yeah. when you were recovering. Recover. He said, no, he said, the lights and all the people and the light at the end of the tunnel. He's like, what are you talking about? He said, and then he did some research. He said, I know what happened. I had a, I had a, I had a, a near death experience. <laughs> and there's nothing like, no, you're full of it. He's like, no, I did. So what happens is him and the boy, and he always calls him the boy, go to see Aunt Betty. The, the local psychic and their old friends. So that's how the, in, in the second volume, that's the connection. Mm -hmm. And when they go, they'd sit on the front porch and wait, 
but they can hear they can hear the conversation of the the, the couple inside and i won't spoil that because that's that's kind of funny because there's aunt betty's doing couples counseling with them <laughs> and they have to sit there like this trying not to laugh while they can hear the entire conversation aunt betty's having with them so there's there's at least four uncle archie stories <laughs> in the second volume so <laughs> and I'll, t I'll, and I'll tell you where that story came from that my grandfather my papa went we had a sonic about two blocks from my house in the east end of Middlesbrough Kentucky <laughs> and I was shaking his head and he never had a slushy before and slushies were a new thing <laughs> And we took him down there and he's like, well, what's some slushy things? And we said, well, we got him one. He got like a cherry slushy. And uh, he sucked about, he went, <laughs> he sucked about half the thing down before we could warn him. And he, he was pacing, his eyes were watering, <laughs> his, the, the veins on his, his, his on his temple, his, on his temples were popping out. And he, we thought he was going to have to go to the hospital. <laughs> he hurt so bad. And when he was done, he cussed and he said that ought to be illegal he said there ought to be a warden on these things because he never had an ice cream headache before so that's that's the genesis of that i've been waiting you know 30 years to tell that story in a different way um what, what tamra hi tamra <laughs> um what do, what do you want the reader to take away from the book Oh, uh, that's a really good, good question. I, I guess, uh, I've, no, of course it's a great question. <laughs> Not, I guess, but it's a great question. <laughs> Take away. I, well, I like most books, you want people to see themselves in it. Mm. And I think people will see themselves and they will see others that they know. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I think I would want people to look for these same people in their own lives because as absurd as absurd as some of these stories are they are based in reality mm -hmm. because if you if you think a little bit about them you can see a headline about any of these things happening yeah you could you could put a headline about one of these things in here lined up against any other absurd headline that's that's true and not be able to pick the true headline out or the fake one right you know there was a one just the other day a woman was trying to shoot a dog in her front yard trying to scare a dog off and shot her her toddler her toddler son man you know or there was another one where she was trying to shoot an armadillo and it ricocheted <laughs> off an armadillo and, and shot a neighbor or something like that. And I'm like, why couldn't I have thought of that? It's, <laughs> but it was real. But it's that's you. All you got to do is go to go to reality to find fodder for stories. It's such good stuff. Uh, yeah, the, the ice cream truck playing Christmas music. That's been through my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, and, and you could just tell that it would it would just go off key just a little bit, and slow down just a little bit because it's, it's a MIDI file and it's just yes. wore out just enough to be creepy. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had that same one. Everyone's <laughs> got the creepy ice cream truck that used to be some other kind of truck. Yeah. It's got bad paint. Yeah. And the genesis of that story came as a flash, sort of a flash fiction poem piece that I did with Aaron Smith. Dur Alan during the the uh, summer uh, poetry boot camps that Aaron used to do at Cumberland Gap, and that sat around for like three years until I turned it into a, you know a short story. Um, and uh, you just never know where you know. Don't throw anything away, writing wise, because you know those notes can turn into something later yeah um what what did you learn while writing this book uh, just how flawed everything in, in in the world is just how 
just how but just how sad something can be one moment and then how hilarious the exact the same moment can be like in in, in such a such an honest way something could be mm -hmm. so hilarious in a, a terribly sad moment to where you're embarrassed to admit to yourself just how funny a moment can be like some of the funniest things in the world's ha world happens at funerals yeah but you know you wouldn't i mean do you know how many like caskets have been dropped <laughs> being carried to the grave you know i mean i have been a pallbearer a lot of times and almost dropped um you know uh, you know <laughs> dropped you know caskets <laughs> you know this stuff it's it's there's really good stuff out there to write about if we mm -hmm. let ourselves write about it. <laughs> I felt there was, I felt that vibe a lot reading about the veterans getting together, that story. That you, and you know so that's a, that's a, that's got to be a true story for something. And you know yeah. that, that 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 someone someone out there in all the years of the Vietnam War, someone had a hand mummified that was actually <laughs> their own hand yeah. and that it made it back to the states or they mailed it back to their mama. Yeah. <laughs> who didn't know what it was when she opened it up and it was a mummified <laughs> hand that they had some Papa son back in Saigon mummify for them when it got <laughs> shot off by a large caliber weapon. And basically all I was doing was, and they're partying, they're partying in a small, tiny little dive bar. Yeah. It was our favorite bar in, in Curie beach, North Carolina, about 20 minutes South of Wilmington. Cause that bar is where I party. When yeah. I go to when I go to Wilmington with my wife every year, we've not been in two years. We should be there right now. Oh. <laughs> Second year, we always go for our anniversary. Two years in a row, we've missed it. Oh. But those those guys converging from all over the country, you know, is a combination of you know me and the guys that I, I was in the army with. We have two year anniversary reunions. My dad started. And, and he has his Vietnam group back home. Mm -hmm. They've done all kinds of projects, but I just see it happening. You know, for, for me, I believe in the multiverse theory of the, of the universe, mm -hmm. that there are, are, are multiple versions of reality going on at all, all the time. And I almost feel like sometimes that I'm tapping into another reality that's taking place and all i'm doing is taking notes mm -hmm. just had to open it up and go what's happening over here oh that's happening and then come back and just report on and it's not fiction it's actual it's non-fiction just in another version of the multiverse it's like anytime you make a decision it branches off yeah and for me i don't um larry brown used to say you know, I just come up with a character and put him in a, in a troubled situation and see what happens. Right. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he would do. And a lot of times they were in a bar. He said, <laughs> I spent a lot of times in a bar and that's what I know, you know? So it, and I don't limit my characters. I don't tell them what to do so much at first. I see what happens. I put them in a situation and I, and I see where they go. And a lot of times, they uh they make the decisions for themselves and they can be questionable and amusing decisions <laughs> yes yes now so you've, you've already mentioned you're you're working on a sequel for this this book that's correct no it's done it's, oh, it's, it's, done. it's already okay. oh it's, it's done yeah there's awesome. there's yeah it's it's already they've we're we've already revised edited it and everything it's it's called Labor Days, Labor Nights. Okay. And so you it's said that's done. coming it's, out in the fall? It's done, yeah. It's coming out in fall. Sweet. Bottom Dog Press. Are you working on any other projects right now? Well, like I said, CM Chapman and, and uh, myself, we did the um, Everyday Monsters. It's done. It comes out in November. And then I've got um, also with unsolicited press, I have my next full collection of poetry that comes out in December called Gateless Menagerie. So this is this is a this is a red letter year. I, I, I'm lucky this year. I have a lot, lot going on.
Do you feel like the pandemic's given you more time to work on stuff like that? A lot of these things kind of hit as COVID was hitting. So they were sort of already in play, but I've gotten a lot more. Um, I've been able to write a lot more in some ways. Right. Yeah. I, I think like that it's, it's, it's an interesting paradox because I know some people say that's like, well, there's the time they have, but then sometimes it's hard to get in the right headspace with all that's going on. Uh, I just, COVID has made people so crazy. It just gave me more material. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> you know, it really is. It, yeah. The world is nuts. Yes. I'm just along for the ride, taking notes. Well, uh, what, what advice would you have for any aspiring authors? Put your butt in the chair. <laughs> would you guys agree? I mean, that's the, the, the simplest thing. I mean, if you, if you just stay, stay in the chair and do the work. And even, even if you're not inspired, you can't, you can't expect to be inspired in order to write. You've got to be able to write when you're, when you don't feel like it. Um, if you don't feel like writing new material, then didn't spend the morning revising, mm -hmm. you know, and if you don't like what you're revising, then maybe what you wrote <laughs> isn't what you need to be writing yeah. you know, or turn it into something else. <laughs> You know, but I, there's four things. This is my mantra, you know, uh, read, write, revise and submit, mm -hmm. repeat. You know, those those are the, the four things that I try to do constantly. Um, if you don't feel like writing, read some read someone good. And I promise you, there's some times when I don't feel like it, but I'll get halfway through a story and I'll be like, oh, OK, I'm ready to write again because I'm so inspired. <laughs> and I'll say, I'm sorry, I can't finish your story. I, I'm ready to write again. You know, it because, you know, just read someone good or read someone bad. You know? <laughs> read, read, read something that teaches you how not to write. Yeah. You know, or, uh, you know, Hunter S. Thompson, he when he was learning he he verbatim typed out um you know a lot of ernest hemingway's books full books uh -huh. just so he could feel the keystrokes of an entire novel wow just to see this is what it felt like to to birth these sentences mm -hmm. he did that on a couple of uh, hemingway uh no full novels wow there there there's so many strange ways that people come into uh their own creativity. Well, uh, would you, would you like to share uh, a reading from your book with us? Uh, part, part of one, maybe. Yeah. There, yeah, yeah. I don't know sure. if we got time for, for I'll, I'll read part of uh, the first one. Okay. Just some of it because it's, it's too long for, for all of it. My light's going down though. As you can see, I keep my Christmas lights up all year long in my writing area. I just like Christmas lights. So, but they don't give off much light right yeah. here, especially when the sun's going down. <laughs> all right. This is, this is the title story, working it off in labor County. That's constable carp yelling for us to watch for idiot drivers. It's a bad stretch of road through here for sure. In fact, an awful wreck killed two kids not long ago. Burn them up. It's a well-known spot now, right up there where our work crews headed to those flat charred rocks. See where the flowers of stuffed animals pile up like a memorial. Let's hope these vests the jailer gave us on the work bus do the trick and keep us from a similar demise. I'm guilty, but my offenses don't deserve the death penalty by a distracted driver. It's not like I robbed a bank and killed someone. It wasn't a bank I robbed. Thank you very much. And no one died. Giving back, quote unquote, is slow going. I'm only halfway through. 
A hundred hours of community service sure does drag on. And the worst is yet to come with the weather. They say the rest of summer might hit record highs. It figures I'd end up out in the heat of the year working. I have brilliant timing. This service is more about thinking than service. I'm convinced of that. It's like the county is just rubbing it in, designed to constantly remind me how I went from having a great faculty position at the college to cleaning up along the roads in front of that same school in a year's time. What a fall from the heights of academia, hey? hey. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've wondered if anyone keeps up with such interesting social plummets from Grace, because that sounds like a record. Maybe whoever publishes the Busted in the Mountains mugshot trade paper might know. I looked and looked, but I never found my picture in it after the police ran me down. Ever wonder why everyone in that paper grins? Like they know something we don't? You'd think they'd be upset getting arrested for their fifth DUI. By that point, it's just embarrassing. But cleaning up roadsides isn't all that bad. That all that bad a gig. We're not that unlike a group of turkey vultures loitering on a thermal to swoop down and clean up behind messy people. That's called a wake. A collective of vultures. Odd sense. That's sort of what it looks like when they stand around pecking on a dead piece of meat. We take care of the occasional festival recovery, tent revival. Ever wonder why people insist on stuffing an illogical amount of discarded personal effects into an already overflowing garbage can? They sometimes take us out to pinch, to pitch in on illegal dump cleanups. We helped with one last month out on the Powhatan River, a really beautiful place all but this 30 foot deep pit of junk sticking out like a sore thumb on the riverbank. Ever wonder why a person would pull off by a river with a truck full, a trunk of trash and tin on tossing it down the bank and something about the river's beauty, maybe the sound of the water on the rocks, the birds, anything, not stop them from ruining that spot. There was a bend in the river not too far downstream. Looked like a grandfather and his grandson were fishing. That place was special to them, I imagined. And there we were, waist deep in rusting refrigerators and rotting diapers. Yet, there are worse ways of working off a debt to society, aren't there? Like behind bars, which I only dodged by the hair of my eye teeth. Life was different not very long ago. I was a professor of history at Middlegate Community College. Now, Alan, you'll realize here that Middlegate is a combination of Middlesbrough and Harrogate. <laughs> Eight years I'd been there. My specialty was the American Civil War, and I loved it. I loved my students, loved the school, and I was happy. I was a nut for history. I'm not so sure anymore. It seems dear Cleo, the Greek goddess muse of history, played me for a fool. I used to keep a picture of her on my office wall. The old girl's only laughing at me now, though. Her and my ex, Clara. Yep, Clara and Cleo, giving up on me. Though the ex hinted we might reconcile after I fulfilled my debt to society. Now hear me out before you assume I'm just another felon who claims he's innocent. I'm not. I'd served two years of a three-year appointment on the Labor County Historical Society Board of Directors when I had a falling out with some of the leadership. That was a shame. I enjoyed having a hand in Labor Town's historical preservation. This is my home, after all. As the only son of the seventh generation of McMichaelsons from Labor County, I've always felt like I had a duty to take up for our little part of the mountains. If we didn't do it, who would? 
It seems like everybody but people from here are sure about what we're about. And they make money being wrong about it. Hey, like that. The old Dillard Memorial City Jail houses, houses the museum, which makes for an interesting setup of cell to cell displays, especially with the cell bar doors intact. Each room represents a different stage in the, the timeline of Labor County history, often with mannequins dressed in period fashions, performing activities from the time. And the museum was always sending volunteers to auctions to bid on lots from stores that flopped. That's the best way to get cheap dummies. Cell number one, pre-Columbian Kentucky. The stone walls were painted to resemble our steep wooded mountains from back when Kentucky was known as the dark and bloody ground. And in the middle of the room were two bare chested makeup smeared Cherokees eating by a fake fire. Cell two, frontier settlement. The walls were painted like the insides of a fort. And in the middle of the room sat a long hunter clad in leather and pelts and a frontier woman sitting and eaten by a fake fire. Cell three, Labor Town established, 1873. The walls were painted like the inside of a cabin, and in the middle of the room was a farmer, his wife, and two kids sitting and eating by a fake fire of the hearth. Cell four, you get the picture. I'll go up a couple more paragraphs. We experienced some petty crime at the museum. Preserving history isn't easy when chunks up and go missing. And it couldn't be helped with well-meaning but unorganized volunteers. The occasional pack of postcards vanished, bookmarks, an irreplaceable, irreplaceable antique yearbook from the library. But when a 10th annual Labor Days, get it, Labor County, Labor Days ashtray went missing, that was a last straw as far as I was concerned. At the next quarterly meeting, I brought up in the form of a proper motion, the idea of installing security cameras. I got a second and we fought for an hour over that idea. And when it came time to voting on actually passing the idea of purchasing a three camera system with monitor, which required three out of five to pass majority, the chairwoman, Teresa, who usually didn't vote unless it was a tie and wouldn't have then if she didn't have to, gave a long speech about how it would send the wrong message to the community. And what would we do if, the, if we accused the wrong person? And what would our, uh, our procedures be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'd done my homework. I had answers for all her concerns. Of course, everyone knew why she was muddying the waters because her husband, Kurt, get this, her husband, Kurt, is the town pet kleptomaniac. He's been ripping off the museum for years. And when I came on board, everyone was used to turning a blind eye. Maybe they thought it was quaint. Maybe they didn't have the proof they needed. Maybe they dreaded the argument. I personally didn't think it was so cute, especially after I'd loaned my Civil War collection to the museum. I'd spent years collecting that stuff. I had a Union three band infield rifle with bayonet, most of a Union officer's uniform minus the left arm of the coat and shirt supposedly ripped off by a cannonball, bloodstains intact, a journal kept by Oliver Ollie Howerton, one of the town founders who survived the war and went on to be Labor County's most successful hog farmer in the 1870s, not to mention a bunch of small items like squash lead bullets and chunks of metal dug up from battlefields. But the best part of the collection, though, was a portion of a battlefield oak tree trunk, six feet tall and full of bullets and solid cannon shot. Alan, you might remember something just like this in our own Abraham Lincoln Museum at Lincoln Memorial University. The damage 
of the battle hadn't killed the tree, some of the iron balls were partially grown over as if the tree was slowly swallowing up the foreign objects. It was a fine collection. They'd even put it all in the corner on its own and called it the McMichaelson collection. I admit I was proud of the little fake brass label. I told them I thought the decision not to heighten security was terribly unprofessional. Teresa said I could quit my I could quit my time on the board early if I felt uncomfortable with the decisions arrived at so democratically by the esteemed board. I told her she could kiss my socialist ass. I should have stayed on and done my best to make the rest of my time on the board as miserable an experience for them as I could. Though I liked most of them, but I figured I had better things to do. So I huffed off with the promise of returning for my property. It was very dramatic. Spoiler alert, this gentleman <laughs> returns to rob the museum of his Civil War collection and fails. <laughs> <laughs> Almost get, <laughs> he almost gets away with it. Yeah. <laughs> That's how he gets a hundred hours community service. Right. <laughs> and, and after having read all the other stories, I catch all the, those references to the other stuff right there at the beginning to other places and people. Did you notice that they were, they were headed to one D's barbecue for lunch yeah. at, the, yeah. at, the, at the end? <laughs> That's a whole different can of worms too. That oh, story. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, does anybody else have any questions they want to ask? I do. Uh, Larry, you said that uh, you like you hope that your readers will see themselves in your stories. I'm wondering what happens when some of your readers think they recognize themselves in some of your stories. <laughs> I don't know if anyone will actually. If anyone was that accurately see themselves, see themselves. But uh, what? Who was it that said that if they didn't want to end up in a story, they should have behaved differently? I, I think you've said that a few times. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have. Jane Hicks might have said it. I might have stolen that off Jane Hicks. Once. Uh, that sounds like Jane Hicks a lot. <laughs> Um, no, I, I am kind of curious about that because you, you talked about taking family stories and uh, I imagine you've tweaked them so that your family members would go, well, it didn't really happen that way, Larry. And and, <laughs> and what kind of response do you have ready for that kind of comment? Well, this is a book of fiction. So um, all of these stories are designed to be entertainment, um, you know. The, uh, the 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 book of true stories. It'll be really obvious that I'm talking about you. Sure. And you know, and I'll name names and tell and tell tales. And uh, and 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 uh, and, <laughs> and with with these stories, it's it's. I think I think that the characters in here are made up of so many different people that, yes. that no no one no one's going to be able to claim one of them individually. Well, I'm, I'm okay. I'm I'm happy to hear that. I think I'm not sure <laughs> if you run across one that that sounds familiar to yourself. You let me know. Well, I, I just thought it was a uh, kind of funny. Uh, uh, not this current novel, but the last novel. Charles Dodd White put Roger May in the book. Oh, yeah. I named him and described him and everything, and and, um, and so I, I, I think part of what was going on is I was wondering if you were tempted to put somebody who actually is alive in your book just as a, just to kind of wave at him or something. Yeah, yeah, I, I am tempted to do that occasionally, but uh, I don't know. It would it would seem some. I don't know. You know, it it, it would it would have to be. I don't know. We'll see. Somewhere yeah, I'm not asking for it. You know, I'm just. <laughs> Wait, I, 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 yeah, I'm thinking now. I'm distracted now because I, I, I'm going to put Alan Holmes in a story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Well, just forget it. Just forget it. Okay. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere, there's a squirrel reading your book. Like, hey, now. <laughs> did, did you just see that 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 red that red squirrel just flopping like that, just hanging on for dear life on the back of that turkey? I think that's those, some of my favorite imagery. Just, 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 just like eating that with tail feathers. <laughs> I just see that in my head. A lot of times, I am, all I'm doing is taking notes of the movie in my head that's taken that frame by frame. Yeah. All I'm doing is just is doing this as the movie is taking place <laughs> like this. I'm a very. I saw an article a couple days ago that there are a lot of people who they don't do imagery in their thinking. Mm -hmm. Did you did you see that article? It's like yes. about internal monologue versus like pictures. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very, very visual in my thinking. If if I'm describing it, I'm seeing it. And if I'm if I'm if I'm writing it, I'm seeing it just like a movie. Uh -huh. It's it's like I'm taking, you know, that's just like like I'm uh, transcribing it. Yeah. Like a police sketch artist over here, like, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the way it works for me, you know, and, and all I do is just let them let it happen. Mm -hmm. Um sometimes that's hard to do because you want to you want to control you want to control what's going to happen. You know, you go so sit down and want to write a story about a man and a woman who uh, went on vacation and by the end they have to do so-and-so that, that, you know, that's not how I, that's not how I do it. Now I may go into a situation where I, I want to write a story that ends like this, but I don't know how they get there. Yeah. So they, they have to tell me how they get there. So, yeah. That just makes it more fun. Yeah. Do we have any other questions from folks? Well, if not, thanks. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks for sharing your your book with us. And thank you. This has been really this fun. Is...